Monica, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great, Dylan. It's really, really awesome to be here. Well, the pleasure is all mine. And uh, as we were just talking about before pressing record here, we've had a little bit of a back and forth trying to actually make this happen and (laughs) to pull back the curtain. It's now Wednesday, April 6th, and we were supposed to record this on Monday, April 4th, which is, of course, the day after the Gorge Waterfalls 50K, 100K weekend. And I sent you an email in the morning saying, I'm exhausted. Can we please move this back a couple of days? And and you said, yes, actually, I just ran American River 50 also. So better to be rested. So we pushed it back a couple of days and and here we are. So that's right. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Um, Of course, you're the co-founder of Rabbit, the running apparel company that we all know and love. Uh, But you're also a runner and an ultra runner. And you've been in the industry for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation, but maybe, uh, maybe we start our conversation with the conversation about, uh, American river, just because we just mentioned it already. (laughs) You finished ninth place over the weekend. And, uh, Yeah, I know you're fifth on the wait list for Western oh my States. Gosh. So maybe <laughs> talk a little bit about American River just to get the conversation started. And then we'll we'll talk about the Western States situation for you because I think it's a unique, uh, a unique position to be in. For sure. Well, first of all, just thank you so much for having me. Um, I just love everything that you you're doing um for the sport and the community. And it's just really fun to to watch what you're doing and watch it blossom. And it's really exciting. You should be proud. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. So let's see, I'm, I'm fifth on the wait list, which is just a total mind. You know what? I mean, (laughs) I'm like, I got, I gotta, I need to commit. I gotta commit. So I have committed, um, the training. Um, but you know, it's just one of those things where for me, I'm, I just that type of personality, like I'm, you know, I got to be all in. Um, so this is definitely, you know, stressing me out a little bit. Um, yeah, so I actually, I was supposed to do way too cool. Let's see. I think that was the beginning of March. Um, just as like a 50 K, you know, just a long run. And I did the race. God, I think it was two or it was definitely, it was, I think a year before COVID hit. And it was like, the total freezing rainstorm sleet. And so the forecast all week for, for way too cool was the same. And I was like, you know what? I just don't need to do that again. (laughs) You see, you're such a Californian. (laughs) No, I'm so soft. (laughs) I'm so soft. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, yes, my softness, um, took, got the best of me. And, um, so I pivoted and I ended up um, doing American river 50 this past weekend. Um, yeah, that was really beautiful, really beautiful course. Um, a lot harder than I probably was expecting. Um, I knew I'd be good until through 50 K. Um, but I definitely like the heat. I just, we haven't had, I haven't been training and, you know, too much heat yet. So, so I guess that was good to experience that. Um, yeah, it, the goal was just to keep moving forward, try not to suffer too much, <laughs> get through it. Um, and and thankfully, I guess I was very surprised when I woke up on Sunday because I just haven't been that sore. Yeah. Um, which which that I guess gave me the confidence boost. Um, that means you're. I, I, I guess <laughs> <laughs> I got to well, get my mind more fit. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an awesome ninth place performance. So with, we got to talk about this Western state situation because it's, <laughs> it's a very unique position to be in that probably not many people actually find themselves in over the course of time. It's all, it's like, you're either in or you're not in. Right. And you got right. 13th on the wait list at the lottery back in December. You're now fifth on the wait list, meaning you've moved up five places. What's that psychology like? I mean, have you been preparing for the race as if you're going to be in since December, even though you're not technically in yet? And, and <laughs> do, you, do you have an idea of kind of what your chances are of getting in at this point? To me, it seems like they're pretty good. Yeah. I mean, everyone's like, you're in. And I think like, I think looking at history, I believe 
the top 25 to 30 pretty much always get in on the wait list. Okay. From my understanding. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, you know, it could be that anomaly of a year and it was COVID and people have been dying. You know, we missed two years of the lottery. Yeah. Um, so people are, you know, going to do everything they can to, to toe the line. Yeah. I mean, like Dylan, I look every day at Twitter at the Western States Twitter. <laughs> that's where I find out if the, if the wait list has moved. Um, and it hasn't moved since I think the 21st, Yeah, March 21st. I'm like, what in the world? So, but I believe May 1st is the cutoff to get the majority of your money back if you, okay. if you don't raise. So I would imagine it would start moving here over the next couple of weeks. But um, yeah, I guess based on the history of the odds of getting in, yeah, I've been training. I mean, but it's actually been nice because I feel like for most of my hundreds, I feel like I'm always cramming. Yeah. You know, it's like you do that 12 week block that you, you cram everything in. And I've actually like right after the first of the year, I kind of kicked off my training and it's been nice. Like, cause I feel like my body's been able to really adapt, um, nicely. Um, you know, I am getting old, I'm getting up there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's been nice. Um, and not just feeling, I guess, like destroyed every weekend, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's a, a, a slower, uh, steadier, yeah process to build up towards it. Well, I hope you get in. I mean, uh, to me, it seems like it's a foregone conclusion at this point too, that there's five people in the field that will likely, unfortunately, for one reason or another, not make the start line and you'll be the beneficiary of it. And of course I'll be there and hopefully we can connect in person and I'll see you off over the top of the mountain for an amazing <laughs> mile journey. That is a bucket lister for everybody in the, in the sport. But, you know, Monica, I love that you live the sport and it seems like you've lived the sport your whole life. And mm -hmm. I really want to focus our conversation mostly on like your professional career. And I know that your athletic career is also something that sort of fed into your professional career. Of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, you're now run the rabbit apparel brand, but I want to sort of start moving towards really telling the founding story of that and how you arrived where you are now by rewinding a little bit. And, uh, you know, we talked about, of course, the, your most recent race and looking ahead a little bit towards Western States, but Let's go back in time. Tell me a little bit about your history with running, about your, uh, maybe you could provide a short synopsis of your 20-year <laughs> career <laughs> in industry, just to help provide the foundation for the rest of our conversation. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I think like most of us endurance athletes, you know, we started at a young age, whether it was a team sport, um, I pretty much did all of them. Um, soccer, basketball, softball, um, you know, just fortunate enough. My parents just sort of threw me in to get my energy out. Um, and I guess, you know, it's always funny cause I'm like, Oh, where did I develop, you know, that competitive drive? Um, yeah. And I, I was always very competitive from the beginning and then sort of stumbled into running, um, to stay in shape for soccer and found out, I guess I had some talent there. <laughs> um, so I ended up, I, I actually, my freshman year of high school and my senior year, I won the mile. Um, I'm from Oklahoma. So I was a state champion in the mile. And I think like during that time in my life, I was always like this scrawny little girl, um, you know, always the smallest in my class underdeveloped, you know, all of those things. Um, but looking back, I'm like, man, that's when like this sport just changed my life. You know, it, it gave me that self-confidence, um, and awareness to just be able to stand up for myself and stand up for things I believe in and really attack anything in my life, um, with coming at it from that sort of perspective. Um, yeah, so it started there and, um, and then also just sort of a funny thing. I was always this gearhead. Like I just had to have the latest and greatest 
spike that came out that season or the running shoe that came out. And my mom ended up like calling me Imelda um, just as a joke because I just had this obsession with running shoes. So I feel what, like what's that gear, a reference to? I don't. So I don't Imelda, get she the shoe. It's like a. Um, she's like it's a cliche. She's Imelda the shoe. What do what do they call? It? I can't even think of the exact name now. But it's like <laughs> an old fashion term. Okay. And she was obsessed with shoes, and so yeah. So my mom, like you know, coined my my new name, Imelda, <laughs> and um, yeah. So that's kind of where like the gear, like I just got into gear. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so then I, I actually ended up not running in college. I had quite a few offers and just kind of had that burnout, you know, um, which was unfortunate, but also like, I think it was good too, you know, because I'm not sure I would be running today, to be honest. Um, yeah, so I ended up, I went to the university of Kansas to just won the NCAAs and hoops. (laughs) Go Jayhawks. Um, I love right. Lawrence. I love Lawrence, Kansas. Oh. My my roommate in college was from Lawrence. So we would go to music festivals and party there. It's a cool town. Yep. Yeah. It's so cool. I loved it. I, I mean, so I had like just an amazing college experience. Um, you know, ran on my own. I ended up doing my first marathon, Chicago marathon, my senior year in college. I ran 359.59. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So then I, um, I ended up after I graduated, I, so I got my degree in business and in accounting and ended up living in Kansas city. And I worked at the local running store, just like part-time on the weekends, just to like, um, meet others in the community, meet other runners, and then sort of to fulfill my, gearhead geekiness yeah. fetish. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did that. And then I, I became pretty good friends with the owner. And he really um, advised me just, you know, just in professionalism. And, and he really pushed me to get a job within the industry oh. and really helped spearhead that for me. Um, yeah, so I ended up getting my first job with Adidas running. And, um, I was part of this pilot program. We were called the rats, which stood for running Adidas technical sales. <laughs> um, yeah, so we did, we, we sold product to all the running stores. And then we also, um, did all of the marketing and events, um, within our, uh, pers- respective territory. Yeah. So just to pause a sec, cause, and I want to pick up kind of here, cause I want to hear about, your experience at Adidas and Deckers, but going back, you said that you were scrawny and <laughs> that running kind of helped you to work on your self-confidence, self-worth as a youngster, and maybe also fed into this competitiveness. Do you still see that through line now in entrepreneurship and business management of like feeling that competitive drive that was maybe born from those early years as a scrawny uh, (laughs) adolescent runner, do you think there's some uh, overlapping skill that you developed from that experience that serves you now in the role that you have with rabbit? Oh, hundred percent. I think, I guess another piece to that, like the competitiveness is the grit piece, you know, and, and just being able to grind it out and not quitting it's like not quitting, but I think the grit piece is like just imperative, um, an imperative entrepreneurial skill. Like you just, you got to just be willing to, to grind and grind and grind and be okay with that grind. Yeah. Um, embrace that grind. And, um, yeah, I, I guess, I I don't know, maybe, I don't know if that's something, a a skill you're naturally born with, or you do develop. I don't know, but I do think I've had that most of my life. Mm. Um, and, and just when the going gets sucky, I don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't, I get pissed, (laughs) you know, at times, (laughs) but like, but for whatever reason, I am able to like go over under around that suckiness through it, you know, um, and figure that out. What a great lesson that is. I was listening to a podcast recently with Dana White and Rich Kleinman. Of course, Dana White's the 
chief executive of the UFC. Say what you want to say about the sport <laughs> and about him right. personally, but the interviewer asked something that you just sort of reminded me of. And that was like, what advice would you give your younger self when you're trying to create what has become a multi-billion dollar sports entertainment property? And Dana just said, stay the course. You know, it's yeah. always going to be hard. It's never going to be easy. And Rich Kleinman, who's Kevin Durant's business partner who manages their business and investment stuff, echoed the same thing. I'm just like, stay the course. It's always going to be hard. And <laughs> just when you yeah. feel like you're starting to get some momentum, there's going to be a new challenge. And that's the entrepreneurial journey. So that's great that, uh, you know, that you sort of uh, resonate with that as well, or that you echo the same sen sentiment. So let's go back to the Adidas thing. So tell us about, because it seemed like you were at Adidas for a while in mm -hmm. your career. So maybe tell us about the experience that you gained there and uh, sort of what, uh, what your roles were across those years. Yeah. So I started, um, like I said, I was part of the pilot rats program. So I was in the Midwest um, where I was calling on running stores um, you know, my little 22 year old self driving my little Volkswagen Jetta all across the plains of the Midwest. <laughs> um, now mind you, I think, yeah, I did get a cell phone, but it was like one of those giant, huge cell phones. So, and it, you know, it costs like a dollar a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there, this was well before iPhone. Um, yeah. So I, I would, and then like, if we, if we were sponsoring like uh, a camp or a race within that territory, I would be in charge of uh, managing that event. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to move from Indianapolis to Boulder, Colorado, um, where the, at the time that was our largest territory for the brand. Cause at that time, actually Adidas was really one of the first brands to break through into the trail market. Um, I don't know if you remember that shoe. It was the response trail shoe, which was, also really cool looking. Um, yeah. So I ended up managing the entire Rocky mountain region. Um, unfortunately I was only in Boulder like 10 months. Um, and then they, they shipped me off to rainy Portland. Um, <laughs> where I sit now, I grew yeah. up in Boulder and now I live in Portland. So. Oh man. <laughs> you're, and you live in Santa your... Barbara, we should say, which is heaven on earth. So you ended up in a good place. <laughs> I know I'm very fortunate. I went from pretty much every move was, was a step up, I would say. Um, right. Oklahoma, yeah. to Lawrence to Boulder, <laughs> to Portland, to, to Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. <laughs> Great. I can't complain. Yeah. Yeah. So then I moved to Portland and, um, yeah, I, I moved to the, the, I was working on the U S business in the running department. Um, yeah, so I did that a few years and then I moved into a different group where we were doing like product creation and development for some of like the bigger key accounts, this, um, like Foot Locker and things like that. So it was definitely a little less technical performance, more lifestyle-y types mm -hmm type product. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I got to travel the world. I got to go to a shoemaking class in Asia. Um, you know, the, the Adidas world headquarters was in Germany and I was going over there probably once a quarter. Um, yeah, I mean, just some of my most favorite life experiences were definitely during that time from, from personally and professional on a professional level and just, um, just really opening my eyes, you know, to, to the world, um, and consumers and product and community. Um, like just one of my favorite things still to this day was, you know, we would go to our factories in Asia and most of the time they would be in these little villages, you know, like where our hotels were. And I would just get up early and go for a run and like, just run through these little towns and just, like try to understand the culture and just how others are living their life in these different countries. And I mean, to, to this day, that's still just like one of the most beautiful and just fun memories I have with running. Um, yeah. So I would just try to, you know, em embrace uh, the travel and immerse myself in it. Um, yeah. So I, let's see, I think I was there till 2003 yeah. um, until we moved here. So I guess let's pick up there. So was it 
a change in career or a pivot in your career that brought you to Santa Barbara? Was it your move to Decker's? Was that why you ended up where you are now? Or did you move there and then get the job? Yeah, so I definitely, we, it was kind of twofold. Um, I did get a job offer from Decker's. Um, but the other piece to that was we could not believe that there was not a running specialty store in this town. Yeah. So that kind of sealed the deal for my husband, Joe and I, and we moved to Santa Barbara and I worked for Decker's and we opened Santa Barbara running. Yes. The yeah. rest is history. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, Decker's is still based there and our listeners will probably know that now Hoka, which is owned by Decker's is based in Santa Barbara. So tell us about the work experience there at Decker's and also maybe talk about how you guys went about building a specialty run store in your hometown and maybe how those two professional experiences uh, helped shape kind of where you are now. Yeah. So I, um, I was heading up, you know, Decker's has a portfolio of brands and I was heading up one of those brands. Um, so I was heading up sales marketing product, um, for that brand. And let's see, gosh, I think I was there seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really, um, for you people listening, I'm sure many of you have heard of the simple brand. Um, and so that it was a rebuild, it was a relaunch. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, again, it was like, you had to go in with an entrepreneurial mindset to do this thing. And it's actually, I, I mean, honestly, I would say it was harder. It's like harder to relaunch a brand than to start a new brand. Really? Um, except, oh. except, except the only difference was, um, at Decker's you have the, you have the capital okay. and the backing and the support, the support system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like the consumer and product and marketing that, yeah, it, it was a real, real challenge. Um, yeah. And again, I was traveling like crazy and then Joe was, you know, we we're getting the store up and going and we were both just working a ton. I mean, a ton. Um, and then we had a first kid and he was eight months old and I had come back from like a 12 day trip to Asia mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just like, Oh my God, this is so hard. Yeah. You know, I just don't know that I can do that. Keep doing this at this speed and, and be the mother I want to be and, and be the professional I want to be. And yeah. So a choice had to be made mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I went on to help Joe with our store. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, let go of the safety net of being connected to Deckers to go all in on the family business. And did you start to have inklings of, I want to start my own brand at this point? Like, was that kind of growing in the back of your mind over the course of time or did that come later? Oh yeah. I always have ideas, Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask anyone here. They're like, Oh God, here yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah. So um, do I. I'm the same type of person. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. So I always had, yeah, I had ideas for sure. Um, but yeah, none of those really came to fruition, you know, um, initially. And then yeah, I mean, I really got involved with the store, like just more on the community and the marketing side. And, and I don't know, do you want to roll into how rabbit sort of, yeah, the birth well, let, of rabbit or? yeah, maybe, maybe let's do that in a sec before we get okay. to it. Cause I, I'd like to just kind of summarize everything that you did before rabbit. Okay. You worked as a sales rep, you worked in product, you worked in brand management, you owned a specialty run store and now you've founded your own apparel brand. So you've pretty much done everything in the running industry. So maybe as you look back at your career, were there any really important moments of inflection or moves that you made that helped you to cultivate this professional career in the sport? You mentioned earlier that your first boss at the first running store sort of encouraged you to get involved in the industry more deeply. Aside from maybe that anecdote, is there anything else that you remember from the early parts of your career that you think really set you up on the 
trajectory that you ultimately took? Yeah. I mean, I think like whenever I show up, um, just always exuding that passion, um, just like authentic, genuine passion. I think I just always have that and have that. And, and, and that, and just like, I get stuff done. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to get ahead, move a business forward, you just have to get things done. And yeah. like, I think I know, you know, when you're in those sticky moments, how to push through those and, and check the box and get things done and move on. And it might not always be like the perfect scenario you were hoping for, but if at the end of the day, like you, things have to get done and, um, and somebody has got to do them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you view I, as your biggest <laughs> strengths? Like, is it the marketing and storytelling side of things? Is it the product creation? Is it sort of the executive leadership type roles? Where do you find your the most joy and where do you think your strengths are most aligned within maybe those? Yeah, I, I would say, okay, well, this might surprise you. Like, I would say the first thing is like my, um, finance background. Mm. I love, like, I love the numbers. <laughs> I'm going to um, need you to help me with our finances here. <laughs> I, let's go. I let's love go. it. I mean, I, I don't think many people would say that, um, but I do like, I, I'm pretty good at it. And I, I enjoy that piece of the business. Mm. Um, but I would, that, that, that's not like a consumer facing yeah. um, proposition. I would say like, I, I think I'm good at seeing a need or a hole in the market and then being able to understand like the viability and, and the commerciality of that problem. Mm. Um, and then, yes, bringing it to market. I, I think I... And I think I have a way of getting people to get behind that idea yeah, and, and come with me yeah. to get it done. Um, That's yeah, I fascinating. Think it's, but it's, I don't. <laughs> so you, you you understand the spreadsheet side of things and how to actually make things viable, to make them feasible so that it's not a money losing operation, but that you also feel like you have an eye for where there's white spaces in the market and how to galvanize people around to come to that understanding also, which all makes total sense and <laughs> all like foundational skills to develop as an entrepreneur. So this is a perfect moment to launch off into the conversation about rabbit. And yeah, I'd love to just kind of open the floor to the founding story, kind of what insight did you have or what opportunity did you see in the market that, led you to the point where you wanted to take this big step and what I imagine was a, a big personal commitment, personal investment at the next step mm -hmm. of your career. Yeah. So let's see, after just helping at the store, you know, I can't even remember how, how long I had been gone from Deckers a few years, you know, like I said, I've always, there's ideas floating. And then as I'm just like working the floor, you know, more every day, looking at the product, assortment, looking at like what's really moving, you know, I just, God, I was like, man, what is going on with the apparel? Like we, we were always at the mercy of the footwear brands apparel, right? So the, the footwear sales rep, footwear and apparel sales rep would come in from one of the big known brands, shoe brands, and they would show you the footwear lineup. And then, oh, by the way, we have some new shorts and a couple tank tops and, you know, and then you, you would have to book that because you, you have to make your shop look full, yeah. not, you know, if you don't have anything on the wall, you look bare and like you're going out of business. Yeah. And so that was just kind of the cycle and that's the product we were offered mm -hmm. in this space, um, in this channel of distribution. And, and, and so like also at this time, I would say that. This is when like the athleisure trend was really coming on strong. And I'll be the first to say, I hate the word athleisure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. And so like you had Lululemon, I mean, 
and I mean, we weren't moving we, like our, literally the cycle in the store was like, you get the new stuff, you hang it, you pray it sells, then you put it on the sale rack. I mean, that was just the cycle. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, oh, what can we do? Like, we have to figure something out. This is just so frustrating. Um, and so at that time, around that time, um, Jill Deering, who is the rabbit co-founder, um, I, I had created this women's race team through the store and Jill was on this team and Jill and I, I mean, we were acquaintances, friends through the racing team. And that was about it. Like mm-hmm. she's an incredible athlete and was on the team and, and she had come to me frustrated as an athlete with gear options, Mm -hmm. um, for her as an athlete, she's like, I don't want to line up on the starting line in this certain brand because I don't feel like an athlete, uh, you know, a true competitive runner. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like, and then I frustrated as an athlete too, but also as a, as a business owner. Yeah. Um, cause I saw the opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So maybe talk about Jill a little bit and how your, cause of course, like the co-founder relationship is a really important thing. And it sounds like it wasn't like you guys had a multi-decade long friendship established. What, uh, skills or experience did she bring the, to the table and how did yours complement with hers? Yeah. So Jill, um, she's an attorney. Um, so she definitely, I would say, um, just in terms of her approach to business, like, which massively complements mine, like Jill is very, um, I would say, um, decisive. I'm, I can be pretty ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Um, she's Jill has a really good gut. Like she's just quick. Um, she works with a sense of urgency, you know, so I think she can grind like crazy. Um, we can grind together. Um, Yeah. And then I think, so like from a, she's very business savvy. And then um, from an athlete standpoint, I mean, she's got great taste and she knows she's, she didn't know specifically how to bring a product to market, but she knew what she likes and, and what her peers and competitors like. Um, And so just like with that insight alone, you know, um, was enough with the insights that I had to be like, wait a minute here, there is an opportunity. Mm. So had she ever had sort of entrepreneurial experience? Cause I think for you, obviously you had this store and that was an entrepreneurial mm-hmm. project. I, I guess, you know, as a fledgling sort of new entrepreneur myself and somebody who never sort of, thought that way at all. I'm wondering sort of the nature versus nurture aspect Mm -hmm. of it. Like, is it something where you feel totally at home with the constant challenge and uncertainty of running your own business and creating something from scratch? Like, do you feel comfortable in that environment or is it something that you've had to kind of develop over time? Because for me, the reason I'm asking is because I've had a really hard time just psychologically, Mm -hmm. like taking the leap of faith and dealing with the constant challenge and coming to terms with the fact that it is going to be just a relentless grind where you have to stay the course, like Dana White Mm -hmm. said. Maybe talk about how you've matured as an entrepreneur and maybe grown to be a a better one uh, with experience. Yeah, I would say like, I think I've always been more of a risk taker that's definitely just sort of my personality. Mm. Um, you know, always, I always like push, I always kind of push a little bit and see Uh how far I can go. Um, you know, it's kind of, what is that? Ask, you know, ask for the moon, ask for the moon or the stars. You never know what you'll get or whatever, but like, I always, for the moon and you'll end up among the stars. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) I'm the king of cliches. Yes. (laughs) Um, so yeah, so I feel like, I guess that's just sort of always been a bit of my personality. So yeah, I mean, but I will say like this thing, um, obviously it's a different type of risk, right? Like 
it's not just impacting, it's impacting a lot of people and that continues to change. I mean, Dylan right now, I mean, it's, you know, you bring on new employees, you, you need more inventory, you, what does that mean? More money. You're, you're, you're like the livelihood of other people or, you know, you're kind of um, Hard. at their fate. It's yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I would say like the leap of faith, that was not hard for me at all. Um, I hundred percent believed in this opera. I saw this like, and thankfully the timing was spot on for this brand to start, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, runners crave this newness and um, uniqueness and these stories and they're, they're a gear junkie just as much as I am, you know, um, is what I found. It's like, God, you give these, feed these, keep feeding these people (laughs) new stuff and they'll, they'll eat it up. Was there massive risk taken? I mean, you don't have to go into detail, but I mean, of course it takes capital, right? It it takes more than just an investment of time. Mm -hmm. Was there and that comes with a lot of self-doubt too. I mean, speaking for myself as somebody who's, you know, sort of put a lot, a big portion of my life savings on the line to try yeah. and build something that also weighs on me, especially, you know, as we employ people and as, uh, you know, with with my wife involved and things like that. And, you know, now in my mid thirties, it's sort of like, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, this is sort of when people start building their careers and I'm now like taking my career in a totally different direction and also putting a significant portion of my life savings <laughs> against Right. Uh, yeah. Talk about maybe the, the risk-taking aspect that you guys took on at the beginning or anything along those lines that uh, you think the listeners would find interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, well, the first thing I'll say, Dylan, um, you're always going to need more money than you think. Yeah. And always like, I, I still, I mean, like it's just never ending. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so that is not going to go away. I mean, it just, it just won't, you know, especially I, you have to remind yourself like the more money you need, that's a good thing you're growing. Right. Like, and that's what I have to remind myself because I get, I tend to get down on that. I'm like, Oh no, we need more money. Like, but that's a good thing. We're growing like crazy and Mm -hmm. we we have to feed this thing. Right. We have to keep it healthy and gassed and, um, for us to keep going. So, yeah. So I, yeah, that is definitely, it, it is a challenge, the, the capital piece of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we, when we started the brand, it was, like, I didn't want to be at the mercy, you know, I've worked for a public company, I've worked for big corporations, like, I want to grow this the way that I want to grow it, and Jill and I want to grow it, and, and that's like, in a really responsible, healthy, organic way, Mm -hmm. where for us, it was like, okay, I've got these two little boys, I'm starting this business, we own a running store, you know, I need to have a life too. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really our approach was like, how can we do this? You know, obviously, yes, we're both very competitive, (laughs) um, and, you know, and want to win and, and want to have like enormous gains every year, but it's more, it was more about just like doing things the right way and, and taking the time we need and making sure we can honor our families and, and have a life and not like be consumed 24 hours a day and be able to sleep. And I want to still run every day. Honestly, I got to get my run in or, or I'm unbearable. (laughs) Nobody wants to be around me. Um, yeah. So, so I think like, yeah, it's, it's, and it just evolves, you know, it's. So, you know, obviously the apparel business, you guys saw an opportunity, but Mm-hmm. I think most observers would probably agree that it's very competitive, right? Mm-hmm. Not to say that there's not opportunity, there's not white space, but it's hard to break through, right? And yeah. you need mm-hmm. a point of differentiation if you're going to try and start a business within this particular category. What did you guys view as your 
unique insight and how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, I think like, I think the first thing, honestly, well, okay. Product is always king or queen, but before I get to that, I would say if you just talk about what our brand name represents, you know, a rabbit, a rabbit is a pace setter. A rabbit is somebody that sacrifices their race for the greater good of another, like just that alone. I mean, it kind of sucks you in. Right. Um, and like what that represents. So I would say like that and the community, like now I think anyone can say, Oh, community, but like really for us, it was, it's like this, it was like this time while well, we're almost six years old, like all of these communities were just popping up. Like, and it's, we embraced the community and like opened, we just opened the door. And like, I think the inclusivity of this brand and the approach we have to the consumer and the way we speak to the consumer and the way we inspire the consumer, it's like, we're just one of you. Mm -hmm. Just come with us. Like, let's do this together. Running is hard. But like, ah, oh, the joy that running, running brings to your life, just like come with us and you'll, you're going to experience it. How did you come up with the brand name? And I'm actually, I was going to ask you this. I thought about this like a years ago or <laughs> when I was going through our own naming process. I was like, how did they get, how did they allowed to use that mark? Because I know that like trademarks are very hard, especially within the apparel category. So maybe talk about the naming process because brand I've come to learn is like so important. Right. And I think yeah. you guys nailed it. And I loved your articulation of sort of the philosophy behind it. Talk about how you guys brainstormed that idea and uh, yeah, yeah came, came up with like your values and philosophy. Yeah. So I think like, well, first of all, we wanted a name that was like easy to pronounce, you know, not too many syllables. <laughs> um, yeah. So like something really simple. And then, yeah, I mean, it just had like just representing um representing the sport in a way that was aspirational, you know, and that people could really get behind. I mean, that was really like it. Yeah. We, it didn't take us long. And actually it's funny. We, we look back and it was actually my husband who thought of it. <laughs> um, Cause Jill, you know, we had a million lists going yeah. and um, yeah. And we were like, that's it. I mean, it was just one of those moments where you're like, yep, that's it. Done. Um, and, yeah. And then we just started the the design process for the mark. Um, yeah. And it what like for the class of um, the class of the trademark that we're in, it actually, we submitted it and we didn't have any issues. So That's here incredible. we are. <laughs> uh, spent so much money on trademark database searches. I know. We, we ultimately, I know. you know, sort of landed on free trail, which is now looking back, just like, I feel like it fits us so perfectly and probably the same way that you feel rabbit fits your business. You just said that product is king or queen. It's always the most mm -hmm. important thing. And so of course I would love to hear about your guys's process. I just had Dave Don Brown, Brian Bark on to talk about sort of the whole process of creating footwear from right. design to, to launch. And I'd love to kind of do maybe a little bit more abbreviated version of it with you. So maybe talk about what, what the product creation process looks like for you guys at rabbit. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, first and foremost, we're all users, you know, users of the product. We're all pretty heavily involved in the sport one way or another, um, whether it's the trails or the roads or in a running group or, on a club or, you know, at these races, you know, I think honestly, that's where we get the best insights. You know, it's just connecting constantly with the community um, and, and just being vulnerable to feedback and criticism and always wanting to improve. Um, when we first started the brand, like, as I mentioned, it was, there was this like, you know, surge of athleisure, you know, coming through the marketplace. And, and it was frustrating because it was like, oh my God, these tank tops, like, you know, go, they come down to my knees or they have like a million straps. 
shorts and and the shorts were just like poofy and like the fabrics they were using were just loud and you know ch- they would chafe and just all of those little nuances it wasn't like one particular earth shattering moment or design flaw it was like a culmination of all these things and we're like oh we can just do this better I mean <laughs> And so we started like, really our whole philosophy is like everything you need, nothing you don't. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. It's just thoughtful designs. It's really beautiful fabrics. It's the little details, you know, those little like, Oh, what is that? You know, there's just something about the product that's just like kind of catches your eye and you're like, Oh, I want to go up and Oh, now I'm going to feel that. And sort of sucks you in. Um, yeah. So, so that, that's like from a design philosophy and it's just, I, I would say like, if we had to use one word to describe sort of our design language, it's freedom. Mm. Um, you just, it's like, you don't want to feel the stuff when you're running. That's the last thing you want. You know, you're out there for a hundred miles. I don't want to feel my gear anywhere. (laughs) So to be more specific about like the process itself, like where, where does it start? Is it a conversation with the consumer? Is it uh, an insight that you have? Maybe it's a little bit of both of those things, but then like, how, how does it progress from there? Do you actually like put pen to paper and start drawing? Do you work with designers? (laughs) I'd love to hear like what the process looks like. Yeah. I mean, now that obviously as we're, getting a little more established. We've got history, right? Of things that are working, fits that work, fabrics that work. There's just things like, don't touch it, you know? Okay. Yeah. Like, don't touch it. And then, yes, like every season, you know, we have a kickoff meeting um, when we're getting ready to brief a new season. Um, and that includes the marketing team. It includes the designers. It includes the product team. Um And then also we're always gathering, like I said, insights from internally, like, Hey, our warehouse staff, they're all running. Like, what do you think about this? What can we do better? What can we do different? Like, what do you think we're missing? So it's just kind of tapping in like to all these different consumer groups um, and gathering those insights. And then also I would say like probably me coming up with ridiculous uh, white space ideas. (laughs) (laughs) um yeah and then we sort of all agree upon like okay this is what we're going to put our energy and money and and invest in and then we go make it happen so yeah it starts with design and and then um and then from there it's you know that that's kind of a a pretty tedious process to landing on the final design um and kind of while that's going on we're also like basically we have a woman actually she lives in Portland who does all of our like color and merchandising. Okay. So she's like literally proposing color palettes and proposing graphics and helping us, you know, how to setting us up from a merchandising standpoint, how does this all work together? And Mm. yeah, so that's pretty tedious. Um, And then at the same time, we're starting our fit process. So we're going through, you know, we'll get a sample back. We'll fit it. First, we kind of fit it. If the fit's pretty close, then we wear start wear testing. Um, so there's a ton of moving parts going on at the same time for one season. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I would say even leading up to that, like if there's cool fabrics we find, we'll just sample them and start wear testing them. Okay. Um, as something like, yeah, maybe down the line, you know, the next season we could bring this fabric into the line. Um, So just always like kind of every day, like approaching the product with an open mind and just researching trends and gathering feedback, whether it's on social media, you know, we'll throw out, you know, surveys and um, we get a lot of um, reviews on the website where we can get information. Yeah. I didn't even talk about, we have our whole teams. Like we, so we have, um, we should, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So like, that's a whole nother, just my, yeah. you know, gold mine of information. So I imagine the first couple of years are tough, right? Cause you're trying to build a brand from scratch. You're trying to get the marketplace to understand your point of differentiation. How did you manage 
cash flow and inventory and forecasting <laughs> like when and and maybe also like when did you start to feel like you were breaking through like when were you did you start to feel like huh this is actually resonating in the way that i thought it would it's funny i so we i don't i'm not sure if you know we launched on kickstarter i didn't know that yes huh. so we but no, we did that more as a marketing play versus an investment play. Um, yeah, that's so we we launched. So the, the the beauty of that was we ended up obviously pre-selling quite a bit of inventory that we had already committed to. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure probably you're seeing probably not as much with some of your merch if you're doing third party, but there's minimums that you just have to hit, you know, at the factory level. So some of that was just like our hands were tied and, and we had to make the minimum and we chose, we still make quite a bit of product in the U S um, but the minimums are, you know, drastically less than overseas. Um, yeah. So we took, you know, and then obviously our margin would take a bit of a hit, you know, but then it's like, okay, I'd rather have, a little bit of a lower margin and not have a ton of inventory left over and then have to blow it out. That's where your spreadsheet skills come in handy. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I think, I guess I would just say from all my years of experience and then the store, like I just know size runs and I just know that stuff just from experience. Um, I just kind of know like, yeah, in a split men's short, you're not going to sell very many larges. Yeah. You know, um, it's going to mainly be your size curve for like a two inch split is going to be more smalls, Yeah, you know, but maybe like a seven inch is going to be more larges. Like I just, from experience and selling stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So one of the other things that I think you could pro- provide a great insight about is just like the nature of the commercial side of the marketplace right now, because you own a specialty run store now mm-hmm. as sort of this wave of direct to consumer is happening while you have your own brand. Right. So maybe talk about the importance of both. Like, obviously there's a place for run specialty and maybe what your guys's strategy is, as it relates to those two channels of distribution. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a great question. Um, we've always from day one been hundred percent invested in both channels. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously I, you know, I have a lot of love and passion, um, for running specialty shops. Um, I think, I think it's, it's an amazing community in and of itself. I think there's a lot of incredible, um, business owners out there just, doing a really, really good job, um, for their communities, for the sport and just really, really sound business people that, that I want to do business with, you know? Um, so when we started, we actually, we first really focused more on the direct to consumer, um, because the wholesale piece of the business is logistically and operationally a lot more robust than, than the direct to consumer. For, you know, uh, there's just a lot more that goes into it. Um, yeah, so we we started small with wholesale. And I would say, like I said, we're going to be six years old in May. We literally just in the last two years have ramped up wholesale in a big way. Like we're now in all doors REI for the first, this spring. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're full on committed to both channels. Um, and we're, we're building the organization to that. That, that seems like a massive sort of inflection point in the history of the company, right. Of like landing that distribution deal with REI. Maybe yeah. <laughs> let us into the, let us be a fly on the wall of what happened there. Was it a moment of celebration of like, wow, after five, six years of toiling away on this, we've landed with one of the biggest retailers in, in the U S I mean, does, is that a big moment of validation of all your hard work? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, it was so sad. We, um, well, I'll never forget the email we got, you know, from one of the buyers that was like, Hey, we, 
we'd love to check out your brand. We're, we're hearing, we're seeing, reading all this stuff about the brand. And so um, my sales director and I, you know, we went up to Seattle, we did the presentation and we landed, um, we land, so that would have, so we la- actually launched with REI in spring 20 in just a small way. And um, we, sh- we were supposed to ship them literally, um, I think two weeks after COVID hit. <laughs> And, and we and so they pressed pause on it they actually did not hmm. thankfully we we got really lucky i mean really really lucky really so what happened was um i think we i can't remember how many stores we were going to roll out to it was mainly west coast but like everyone else the d to c you know everyone's d to c business went crazy during yeah. that time and so their website could consume that inventory and they needed wow. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've been slowly growing in there. So that was the spring 2020. So yeah, I guess two years later. Um, yeah. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a, Congrats. Big, it's a big deal on all levels. And you want to talk about cash flow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's a really yeah, exciting I'm sure time. it provides yeah new challenges though, too, because you kind of have to, rise to the occasion and make sure that you're managing the, your inventory and fulfilling the orders that you're committed to. Yeah. And in there, the way like you do business with them from a compliance standpoint is just totally different than anyone else. So, you know, learning all those, those parts of the business and um, yeah, but it's great. I mean, I, our team has been crushing it and it's, it's been really cool. Cool. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. So one of the things I also really wanted to talk to you about is just being female founded business. And before we hit record, I was asking if you need to go at any particular time. You said, well, I got to pick up my son from flag football. So you've mentioned your family and being a mother a couple of times. So I'd love to hear just your reflections on, you know, any challenges or just what the experience has been like as a female entrepreneur who's also a mother and maybe if there's any responsibility or any pride that you carry as a result from sort of holding that position within the market. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll first just say like, I've been really fortunate. I would say just like through my younger days as an athlete and then throughout my career, like, I mean, let's be honest, like this industry has been a man's, it is a man's world. I mean, I, you know, and, but I feel fortunate that I've been able to, I've always, I've always worked fine under in those situations. Um, so maybe that like, of course it gives me a different perspective, you know, on how, like when it is my business, how I can run my business and what to do and what not to do. And, but I've also like, I, I've learned a lot too, of like very valuable experiences from working, um, in a male dominated industry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, I would say like being a mother for me, there's just so many life lessons, like every day, if, you know, if, if, um, issues come arise, um, I'm always trying to the, my learning lesson, I'm always, my learning lesson is okay. How can I make sure I set my kids up to be able to navigate these situations? Obviously, you know, they're not going to be like, I'm not talking about the minutia business stuff, but just like in general, running a business, dealing with people, dealing with different types of people, different personalities, um, you know, how do you wrap your arms around that and adapt to those different people and different personalities and embrace it? And, and, um, yeah, it's like, I want to make sure my kids, um, I'm showing them a path that, um, I'm trying to think how to say this, like just showing them a path 
giving them the guy, the light, I guess, you know, um, they see the hard work, they see the grit, they see the, that you have to work hard and, but you know what, like you can still be a good person. You can still do all these other things. You can still have fun You can still be a good family person. Um, you can still be a good mom or dad. Um, and you can also, you know, do really do amazing things in your craft. Um, I would say, I'll be honest, like for me, um, not, I, I feel like my life is balanced and in harmony to your wife's name. I, I, a lot, most of the time. Um, but like, yeah, I think it doesn't turn off. I would say that's the the hardest thing. Like it really just does not turn off. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like it, the only time it does turn off is if I'm, you know, I'm distracted with another like issue or, um, you're just always thinking about it, but, but I also, I think that's okay. Like it's okay too. And I try to be at peace with that, like, and not fight it. Cause I feel like, um, when I'm fighting it, it, I don't know, I'm just more agitated and anxious. Um, so I just try to embrace, you know, embrace it. Yeah. So maybe whatever you can share about the growth of the brand, I'd love to hear just in terms of, obviously it started from just an idea with you and Jill. Mm -hmm. Now you're in REI, you referenced the fact that you've brought on more people, you've got the warehouse. Talk about uh, where the brand is now and kind of like what the roadmap is ahead for you. And then I kind of want to start talking about the athlete thing. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. I would say um, the brand, this brand, it's an amazing brand. I mean, um, it really is. It's a beautiful, really freaking cool brand. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, I'm really proud where we're at really proud. It's really, really cool. Like to soak in, we don't do it enough. Soak in the success. We talk about that all the time here (sighs) in our little team too. Cause like, especially me, like we've had a lot of really cool shit happen and I'm always the one who's stressed about like some (laughs) other thing that we need to be, that we, it's like a little bit of a challenge and I don't celebrate the small victories nearly enough. So I know we just had like our, um, this morning, I call them our raw raws. So we do like a quarterly raw raw for the company and we did our Q1 recap raw raw today. And it was just like, God, I mean, we're crushing it. Like, and that's the thing. It's just like, I want everyone in this company to just be freaking stoked. Like, I want you to love your job. I want you to come in every day stoked about what you're doing, about what we're doing. And like, just know that you're just a part of much of part of this journey and success is Jill and I, and like, we're just doing amazing things. And like, yeah, of course there's days where we're frustrated and they're hard. And, but like, man, like if we just keep, like you said, stay on the path, you know? Um, yeah, I think I, it's there's a huge opportunity, Dylan. I mean, a huge. I don't know what it is, honestly. Yeah, I don't know, but um, it's huge, really, really huge. Mm. Jeez, you're getting me excited. <laughs> people uh, love working for you. So <laughs> you, you referenced a, a second ago about you know the athlete teams that you guys have, and you have some of the best you know trail athletes in the world competing, sort of representing your, your brand, including Amanda Basham, Justin Grunewald, Eric Sensman, Anna Frost, the legend. (laughs) Talk about your guys' athlete strategy and uh, yeah, anything there that you think is interesting. Yeah. So we um, basically, we, we have three tiers for our athletes and our team. So um, the, the, top level is rabbit pro and athletes that you just mentioned are on that team. Um, so those athletes are under contract, um, with the brand, you know, really when we, when we started the brand, it was, I wouldn't say sign, let's sign as many people as we can, but it was like, yeah, we just wanted to connect with amazing athletes and like bring them into the brand and have them be a part of the process and, and growing this thing with us. So it kind of started, I would say a little broader. And then we 
we've brought that team, we've refocused it um, just now so we can offer more resources for that group of athletes and just be more engaging with them. Um, yeah, so that team um, is pretty tight. Just, yeah, incredible roster of human beings that I just love all of them. Um, and then we have our elite level, which is, um, I would say like more amateur. Most of these athletes are probably, you know, have full-time jobs and they're still running competitive, um, you know, on the side. And, and we have, so under the elites, we have a trail team and then we have a road team and that comprises, um, I believe right around 50 athletes on each of those teams. Um, so there's different perks and that's structured obviously a little differently than the, they're not under contract. Um, and then under that, we have our amazing rad rabbit team. Um, so rad is stands for runners and dreamers. Um, and this team renews every year. So we'll actually, if you're listening and you want to be a rad rabbit, um, we'll be opening up that application window next month. Um, but yeah, it's like, 1200 athletes wow. that are in that on that team in that community that are just like I mean that's what I mean you talk about insights it's like okay let me just go ask a rad rabbit wow. I mean it's yeah um it's amazing they're amazing they're so passionate about this brand they're just so engaged um you know I've noticed just, that a lot on social media you know I, and just in conversations around the community I mean people really love your brand and they resonate with it a lot. And, uh, you can tell they feel a sense of loyalty to it also. Mm -hmm. That's probably yeah, the I think, of, of building it in the way that you have not, not only commercially, but engaging with the, the rad rabbit team and the elite team, et cetera. Yeah. And I think like, just, we have somebody, um, that manages those teams, but just, yeah, I think just like, I would say like everything, just make humanizing everything, right? Like we're not this behind robot behind the screen responding to you. You know, it's just, it's real humans and we care about you. And like, we want to hear what you have to say. And we want to, we want to, you know, support you and your endeavors and journeys. And we want to celebrate your victories and, um, yeah. So it, it's a lot of fun and, um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's really, really cool. Very cool. So I just noticed recently a new project on Eric Sensman's Instagram, the born to run free project. You guys have always been really good with storytelling and it seems like this is a new initiative that you're starting very soon. It sounds like, what can you tell us about the born to run free project? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we did have, um, the story goes, which were basically Eric's stories. You know, it would be some crazy story that, that he would tell our consumers in written, written format, blog format. And yeah, we have this tagline and hashtag born to run free and people really just resonate. It resonates mm -hmm. with runners. Um, and so we, with Eric, you know, going into this year, we wanted to really evolve, you know, that, that platform of the story goes. And I mean, as you know, Eric, I mean, he's just a wonderful storyteller. He's an amazing writer, interviewer. I mean, he checks all of those boxes and Fantastic. he's super, cre yeah, yeah. And, and super creative and just talk about getting stuff done. I mean, the guy gets stuff done. Yeah. I mean, it's, and yeah, so we, we brainstormed and we came, came up with this idea and we'll be, um, I, I think it's, it might be this Friday, the first, the first one launches. <laughs> yeah. So it'll just Perfect. be these stories about, um, runners in our community. Um, and we'll, we'll be telling those stories in video format as well as long form blog. So yeah, I, I'm excited. There's so a lot of just gold mine of information and just amazing stories, you know? Well, I, uh, will keep my eye out for it. I think we'll put this up next week. So by the time it goes live, maybe the first episode will be active and I'll make sure that I link to it, but yeah, uh, it's yeah. a good one. It's I, a good one for sure. Good. Awesome. And yeah, I totally echo 
your sentiment about Mr. Sensman and he seems like he's uh, been a great rep- not only representative of the brand, but uh, somebody who's probably helped to make product better and, you know, lift, lift the, of the brand in the marketplace. I love that guy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's a this, special one. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I could keep going for like two hours, but maybe <laughs> we'll do another one of these in the future. I want to just close with a question I've been asking people recently on the podcast that I've found to be very illuminating. And that is, what is a, like a failure or a mistake that you've made in your career that with some hindsight you really learned from or brought value down the line? Like what, what did, is there a, a, a mistake that you've made in your career and something that you learned as a result from it that you think would be powerful for the oh, listeners? Man. Oh man, this is a good one. Um, I would say, um, I wouldn't say it's one particular, it was kind of like compounded over time earlier in my career. And that would be just learning to listen more, have more of an open mind. Um, I would say I, I tend to be very emotional and overly passionate um, at times which can supersede, um, you know, others on my team or in my company feeling comfortable bringing their ideas to the table. Um, because it can be overpowering, right? If you're overly emotional, overly passionate, overly loud and not, not having your eyes open and your ears turned on, (laughs) um, So I would say that for me, like just respecting that process of like everyone, everyone has a voice. Um, Most people have really valuable, amazing ideas and things to bring to the table and just learning. I I think that's like a practice, Hmm. you know, do you think that was born from like a want or desire to be kind of protective of your thing of like maybe being less open-minded to people's ideas and opinions because you felt like it was, it was your thing and your ideas. And therefore you were less, less open to the input from others or. Yeah. Or maybe I just had already like, I already had the foresight to, to see my idea, like come to light. And then having that sidetracked, like I, I couldn't process that maybe, mm-hmm. you know, or like being open to like, oh, wait, you know what? We could still get to that end result, but maybe this way is better to get to it. Uh-huh. Cool. Very <laughs> yeah. cool. Well, Monica, I really appreciate you coming on the show. This has been an absolute joy. I mean, we've gone like an hour and 15 minutes already and I could do, I could do another hour with you. So I would love to sit down and go, go deeper on some of these things in the future, but overall, just the big admirer of what you guys have built, um, big admirer of the product and yeah, I'm grateful that you would come on the show and share some of your hard earned experience (laughs) and insight with us. I, I, it's been so fun. And like, I am anytime you need advice or help, you know, as you're going down your path, um, I, I would be more than happy to be a sounding board or whatever you need. I, I would love to help. Um, so please, please reach out if you, if you need that. Well, I absolutely do. And I will absolutely <laughs> think you on that. But. If you need some spreadsheet help, <laughs> I'm always here. A hundred percent what I need. I'll follow up uh, another time on that when we're not being recorded. So Monica, thanks so much again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dylan.